All right, we've got a big one for this episode. In fact, this is arguably the most important PlayStation release to date. This is Mortal Kombat 3, a port of developer Midway's 1995 arcade fighting game. This isn't just any old arcade port, though. The PlayStation version of MK3 was published by Sony itself, and its release catapulted Midway into the home console market, where it quickly established itself as a major industry player. We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, though. To fully appreciate MK3's impact, we should take a quick look at how Mortal Kombat took over American arcades in the early 90s. Midway released several arcade hits throughout the 80s, but by 1992, few games could match the popularity of Capcom's Street Fighter II. Its release revitalized arcades worldwide and brought together a dedicated competitive community. Around the same time, Midway was ramping up its arcade hardware, allowing games like NARC and Terminator 2 to feature digitized character graphics. After studio execs saw how local Chicago arcade owners were literally buying houses with their earnings from on-location Street Fighter II cabinets, Midway set out to create its own fighting game, one that used digitized graphics featuring real-world actors. Mortal Kombat wasn't originally called Mortal Kombat. It was simply called Van Damme, and a prototype version featured digitized sprites ripped from the Jean-Claude Van Damme film Bloodsport. After licensing plans fell through for Van Damme's likeness, Midway's developers called on their local friends to help film new digitized footage for the project, which now had an original storyline and a unique cast of characters. Now, while early 90s Midway games like Smash TV and Super High Impact Football had been very successful, the company was hardly flush with cash, and Mortal Kombat's design team was smaller than you might think. How small we talking here? Well, the original Mortal Kombat is credited to designers Ed Boon and John Tobias, artist John Vogel, and musician Dan Forden. That's it. Just four guys. Those four guys somehow managed to complete Mortal Kombat in just eight months, and the finished product battled Street Fighter II in arcades in 1992. So, what sets Mortal Kombat apart from Street Fighter II? Both games are similar conceptually, but they feel a lot different in terms of execution. For instance, Mortal Kombat players need to hold down a block button in order to block attacks. Mortal Kombat also lacks Street Fighter II's combo mechanics, and attacks in general have more audiovisual impact. Let's see, what else? Oh yeah, at the end of every match in Mortal Kombat, you can kill your opponent. I don't think they'll have this at home, no. You don't think so? <laughs> a little bit you too look violent. A little startled. Yeah, it's a little too violent, I think. In a 2016 interview with Game Informer, Mortal Kombat co-creator Ed Boon revealed that Midway's intent was to produce, quote, an MTV version of Street Fighter. And I'd say that they succeeded. In the end, Mortal Kombat's rushed, chaotic production gave the final product an edge and a mystique all its own. The graphic violence was just a controversial cherry on top. Mortal Kombat's success in arcades was only the beginning, however. Mortal Kombat! Publisher Acclaim later got the license to produce home console versions of Mortal Kombat, and reportedly spent 10 million US dollars on marketing their release as part of the famous Mortal Monday ad campaign. News media outlets in the United States were also nice enough to give Mortal Kombat a ton of extra publicity at the height of its popularity. Yeah, pretty violent. Like, but not as uh, violent as uh, that Mortal Kombat game. That game's like you can tear off their head. And in the eyes of some experts, tearing off their heads is not the best way for kids to spend their time. A horrifying possibility for parents who can't believe the game makers are fantasizing about decapitation and murder. Yeah, it turns out a lot of moms don't like decapitations. That's pretty bad. I mean, that, that's just plain gross. In 1993, Mortal Kombat was one of many offenders cited in a U.S. Senate hearing regarding video game violence. Mortal Kombat also played a crucial role in the formation of the ESRB content rating system for video games, which is still in use today in the United States. Between Mortal Kombat's towering arcade presence and its media notoriety, it became one of the most popular video games of the early 90s, and one of the most infamous. Mortal Kombat 2 was an even bigger success when it hit arcades in 1993, and Mortal Kombat 3... well, I guess it's finally time to talk about Mortal Kombat 3. While Mortal Kombat 2 was mostly an iterative upgrade over the original Mortal Kombat, MK3 makes several major changes to its core gameplay. There's now a run button, which lets you charge up to your opponent from across the screen. 
Mortal Kombat 3 also introduces a combo system, which takes inspiration from Rare's 1994 arcade fighter Killer Instinct. Each character has a set of predefined combos that you can chain together by tapping a specific sequence of buttons after a successful hit. Fighting game fans refer to this as a Dyla combo system, which from what I can tell is generally frowned upon due to its impact on gameplay balance. Basically, it makes combos easier to pull off, but it favors memorization over skill. Mortal Kombat 3 also shakes up its playable cast, as 7 of its 15 characters are new to the series. Many returning fighters get new costumes, and Kano and Sonya from Mortal Kombat 1 make a comeback after skipping out on Mortal Kombat 2. And of course with new characters comes new finishing moves. By now we're long past the primitive days of MK1 where there was only one fatality per character. All characters in Mortal Kombat 3 have at least five finishing moves each. That includes two fatalities, a babality, and a friendship again. Friendship. Friendship again? New to Mortal Kombat 3 is the animality, which, yeah, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Bottom line, Mortal Kombat 3 was at that point the biggest game in the series in terms of content, and its home release was hyped like no game had been hyped before. Like with the first two Mortal Kombats, Midway licensed the rights to the home versions of Mortal Kombat 3 to Acclaim, who contracted Sculptured Software to produce ports for the Super NES and Sega Genesis. Previous Mortal Kombat home ports were generally solid, and they maintained the basic look and feel of Mortal Kombat's 1 and 2. On the other hand, they also reflected the limitations of 16-bit console hardware. Characters were smaller, were less detailed, and had fewer frames of animation than they had in arcades. Music and voice sample quality also suffered. That didn't make these ports any less successful, but by now, players knew what to expect from the cartridge versions of MK3. Sony, meanwhile, knew that it wanted a PlayStation version of the latest Mortal Kombat game within a month of its console's launch, but it didn't want a farmed-out port from Sculptured Software. Using its marketing muscle, and probably many, many millions of dollars, Sony convinced Midway to develop a custom PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3 using in-house assets and an internal development staff. Sony also assigned a first-party production team to the project to help Midway meet its deadline while providing quality assurance. There was just one problem here. Midway was exclusively a developer and manufacturer of arcade games. It didn't have a home console division. Luckily for Midway, its parent company, WMS Industries, had recently acquired Trade West, a Texas-based publisher that had found some initial success by publishing NES games like Double Dragon and Battletoads. But the company's popularity had waned in the 16-bit era, leading to its eventual dissolution and sale. After the acquisition, Midway started picking out programmers and artists from Orphan Tradewest Studios. Ultimately, the developers of Tradewest games like Double Dragon 5 and Troy Aikman NFL Football became Midway's in-house development team for the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3, and a strict deadline from Sony put them under intense pressure to meet expectations. But Sony was determined to make Mortal Kombat 3 a major part of its PlayStation rollout in North America, and by whatever measures were taken, the custom-built PlayStation version of MK3 was a sales success and a critical hit. The October 1995 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly gave the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3 its Game of the Month award, beating out contenders like Killeek and Total Eclipse Turbo. EGM's review was typical of the critical response to the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3. In terms of its core mechanics, the port was widely praised as arcade perfect, with reviewers only noting some minor differences in combo knockback and the timing for aerial juggles. Otherwise, all content from the arcade version, including backgrounds, modes, the characters, and all of their finishing moves, had hit the PlayStation fully intact. It's not all good news, of course. Mortal Kombat 3's digitized characters each have a ton of frames of animation that need to be loaded into the PlayStation's memory before each match. Now, this is no problem for when the game only needs to load enough animation for two characters, but this is a big problem if you play as the shapeshifter Shang Tsung. Luckily, his transformations are disabled by default, so they won't break up the match if you're fighting the computer. Still, it's an obvious limitation of the hardware, and one that wasn't an issue on cartridge-based media. Otherwise, the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3 is actually an upgrade compared to the original arcade release. You can access a 15th character, Smoke, with a secret code, and the PlayStation port's audio was mixed in stereo, whereas the original arcade version was mono only. To use an outdated but period-appropriate comparison, the difference between the cartridge ports of MK3 and the PlayStation version was like going from VHS to Laserdisc. By now, the message was clear. In terms of arcade ports, the PlayStation can deliver a premium experience.
So, this is a home run, right? The PlayStation version of MK3 is a better-than-perfect port of one of the most popular contemporary arcade games of 1995. And yet this was arguably the beginning of the end for the Mortal Kombat series as we knew it. Why is that? Well, there's a few reasons. One of the first things you might notice is that in terms of art direction, MK3 is much blander than its predecessors. Whereas previous games had you fight in ancient temples and haunted forests and stuff, Mortal Kombat 3 makes you fight in a bank and a subway. The overhauled cast also disappointed many players. If you played as Johnny Cage, Scorpion, or Raiden in MK1 and 2, it's time to learn a new character because those guys were completely dropped from Mortal Kombat 3's roster. Johnny Cage actor Daniel Piscina famously left the series following a lawsuit over his likeness appearing in the home versions of Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, allegedly without his approval. Other Mortal Kombat cast members also severed ties with Midway following similar disagreements over royalties, leaving Midway to fill the gaps in MK3's roster with lookalikes and newcomers. And these guys don't have the same on-screen charisma, I guess you could say. Take old Curtis Stryker here. So you can play as mutants, cyborgs, and a traffic cop. This guy's basically the Poochie of the Mortal Kombat series. In another questionable move, Midway decided that ninjas were out and robots were in. And sure, while Cyrax plays somewhat like Scorpion, watching your opponent flop around in a net doesn't have the same kind of impact as stabbing them in the neck with a harpoon and dragging them across the screen. At least Sub-Zero plays like his old self, even if his new costume is... <sighs> Dude, put a shirt on. And then there's the fatalities. While it's true that there's more finishing moves than ever, many of them are very silly looking. This continues a trend that started in Mortal Kombat 2 with babalities and friendships, but the animalities are just... Well... Okay, no, that one's, that one's actually great. It's the gunfire that gets me. I'm sorry. In another blow to Mortal Kombat's competitive scene circa 1995, Mortal Kombat 3 shipped with some major balance issues. If you're playing the game at a high level, this limits your choices to top-tier characters like Cabal, Sub-Zero, Cyrax, and later Smoke once he was unlocked through a code that you can enter after the game over screen in later revisions. Speaking of unlocks, a bunch of optional features are unlockable via codes you input on MK3's character select screen, which is pretty unusual for an arcade game. For the most part, these codes change things like damage output, but a few of them unlock fights against hidden characters, and one lets you play a weirdly difficult Galaga-style minigame. That was pathetic. This combination lock is something revolutionary in our industry. These codes were released across every possible media channel as part of a marketing blitz that was recognized as the largest promotional campaign for a fighting video game in the 2011 Guinness World Records Gamers Edition. How will the game be advertised? With the most aggressive campaign our industry has ever seen, all major player and trade publications will be bombarded with ads like this. Back in 1994 and 95, you'd see MK3 codes printed in magazines, flashed on the screen during TV commercials, or even while you were playing Bally Midway pinball tables. Mortal Monday was a defining moment for the games industry, but Mortal Kombat 3's ad campaign was inescapable and kind of obnoxious. It's an unending supply of merchandise and Mortal Kombat awareness. In the long run, this only served to magnify MK3's shortcomings, as the game buckled under the weight of its own excessive hype. Oh, and if you weren't already sick of MK3 by the end of 1995, Acclaim's Mortal Friday campaign for the home release kept consumer awareness at a fever pitch throughout the holiday season. By the way, it's worth noting that these home ports launched only six months after MK3's original arcade release. This infuriated arcade owners, who would naturally see a massive drop-off in MK3 cabinet revenue as a result. Just as a point of comparison, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 hit consoles almost an entire year after their original arcade releases. In order to appease arcade operators, Midway quickly shipped out a free upgrade kit that transformed MK3 arcade cabinets into Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. This version restored many of the characters that were cut from vanilla MK3, added some more interesting backgrounds, and attempted to fix the game's balance issues, to mixed results. This upgrade shipped to arcades in November of 1995, making the home console versions of MK3 obsolete about a month after they hit store shelves. And that's the real tragedy of the PlayStation version of Mortal Kombat 3. It's a nearly flawless port of an arcade game that became irrelevant almost immediately. Strangely, Midway never developed a PlayStation version of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, though ports were later released for the Sega Saturn and 16-bit consoles. 
The PS1 eventually got Mortal Kombat Trilogy, which is basically Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 with a bunch more characters, moves, and secrets. Despite its initial success, MK3's inability to live up to its own hype lost midway a large segment of its player base, both in arcades and at home. Mortal Kombat 4 was a flop, ending the franchise's arcade era in 1997. And while Mortal Kombat eventually reclaimed some of its popularity on consoles, Mortal Kombat 3 made it clear that the series' time in the spotlight was over. Meanwhile, behind the scenes in 1995, Midway and its parent company Williams had big plans. The development teams and production staff pieced together from the remnants of Trade West formed the backbone of a new company called Williams Entertainment, which published PlayStation games like Doom and Williams Arcade's greatest hits. The studio was later renamed Midway Home Entertainment after Williams made an initial public offering of Midway stock in 1996, establishing a console publishing branch for Midway for the first time in the company's history. This meant the end of Midway having to license its arcade properties to companies like Acclaim, and the company was free to tackle the console market on its own terms. Midway produced dozens of games for the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and Nintendo 64 throughout the 90s. By 2000, Midway was the fourth largest publisher of video games in North America in terms of sales, trailing only Nintendo, Electronic Arts, and Sony itself. So, while MK3 marked the end of Mortal Kombat's popularity in arcades, its PlayStation release kicked off a series of events that ultimately changed the course of console gaming history. Not bad for an arcade port. And that's about all I have to say about Mortal Kombat 3. Thanks for watching! We are Retro Pals, and if you want to see more of what we do, you can subscribe to be notified of when we post new stuff. Up next for PlayStation Year One is... oh, it's another Midway game. We'll take on Razor Ramon and Bam Bam Bigelow in WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game, in the next episode. We'll see you then.